Sarai and Sarah, same person. So we're going through Genesis, okay? And I'm thinking, okay, a Mother's Day message out of early Genesis, what better than the mother of nations? Because that's what she becomes. So it fits perfectly, and we never even had to adjust what the message was were going to be. So we're going to cover chapters 11 through 21 in the book of Genesis. Um, and since it is Mother's Day and I get to do the cooking, there is no rush whatsoever. <laughs> yeah. Genesis 11, 29 through 30, Abram and Nahor took wives for themselves. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah and Ishka. Sarah was barren and had no children. Now, we got to kind of set a foundation here of kind of things that are kind of interesting, because so often in Scripture, especially in the Old Testament, we run across things that say, that can't be right. <laughs> Something wrong here. But Abram, he married his half-sister. That was his wife. Okay? And we think, yeah, that's not quite good. But Nahor, his brother, married his niece. Okay? And we think, wow, this is a strange family. I mean, this is the foundation of the church. No, nope, actually, it doesn't happen until the children of Israel leave Egypt and the book of Leviticus is written. That's kind of interesting that actually that law was not there until then. But this is the first woman that's named since Eve. Interesting in scripture, we have a long stretch of history, but the next woman after Eve that is named is Sarah or Sarai. Okay. Eve being the mother of all living, Sarai being the, or Sarah became Sarah, became the mother of all the nations, or mother of nations, referring to the nations of the family of God. So she is kind of like the mother. And we're going to see how this whole concept of wife, mother, sister, actually fits into the providence of God. Genesis 12, 11 through 13, And it came about when he came near to Egypt that he said to Sarai, his wife, See now, I know that you are a beautiful woman. And when the Egyptians see you, they will say, This is his wife. And they will kill me, but they will let you live. Please say that you are my sister so that it may go well with me because of you and that I may live on account of you. She's a double agent. But what is the difference between the relationship of a spouse and a sibling? Okay, take the relation, sexual relation part out of the whole equation. Don't even go there. Leave that alone. And you look at it, and there is a difference. Okay, now, a spouse, generally speaking, is somebody that we have chosen. A sibling is somebody who was chosen for us. Okay? First difference. Second difference is the relationship between a spouse and a sibling depends on the circumstances of how much communication there will be on a certain subject. There are certain subjects that you talk to a spouse about that you would not talk to a sibling about. And there are also certain things that siblings will talk about amongst themselves, but a spouse won't. So you really don't think about these things, but these are things that we already have known, but we don't see how they really apply. But if Sarai being the mother of nations, or the mother, not the mother church, but the kind of the mother of the church to come, coming out of Abraham, and that she is symbolized as, as a wife, well, who is the church but the bride of Christ? Who are we inside of the church? Brothers and sisters of Christ. Hey, what are these cool little things that you never thought about on Mother's Day? But again, it fits. 
Okay? So, this whole concept of using that lie, not lie, in Egypt, Abraham and Sarai did it again later on, a number of years later. Which is kind of interesting because when they did it later on, Sarai was almost 90 years old. So she must have been a very attractive woman. And she, she only lived to be 126. So it wasn't like she lived to be five, six, seven hundred. Okay? So, kind of interesting little facts there. But the beauty of the bride of Christ is there. See again? We see this stuff that isn't there, it's never there. But it was always was there. The culture and the times will define the circumstances, but never the teaching. Do you see how we looked at something and the first thing we thought about, Abraham married his sister, and his brother married his niece? That's culture. Oh yeah, or Kentucky. Yeah, I understand. <laughs> but the teaching behind it is consistent. See how we looked at a few things out of it? We took a look at how the relationship between husband, wife, brother, sister, church, all these teachings were there. So we got to look at these kind of passages and say, let's not say because Abraham married his sister that the Bible teaches marrying your sister is right. No, it doesn't. That's not the teaching. Because the Bible, what it teaches, is true for all times. It was true then. It is true now. It was true 2,000 years ago. The truth doesn't change. Because in Hebrews we read, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Who is Jesus Christ? In John we read, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So the teaching of the Word of God is Jesus Christ is unchanging. So whenever we say, well, you got to understand it by the culture and all that, that's helpful. But the basic teaching didn't change, because it was the same teaching then and now. Understanding the culture gives us a little better depth in pulling out the teaching but it doesn't change the teaching. One of the things that we have to understand as we continue on. Genesis 16, verses 1 through 3. Now Sarah, Abram's wife, had bore him no children, and she had an Egyptian maid whose name was Hagar. So Sarai said to Abram, Now behold, the Lord has prevented me from bearing children. Please go into my maid. Perhaps I will obtain children through her. And Abraham listened in the, to the voice of Sarai. And Abram had lived ten years in the land of Canaan. Abram's wife Sarai took Hagar the Egyptian, her maid, and gave her to her husband, Abram, as his wife. A couple of things I want to look at in here. Okay, now, you remember, they just had moved from Egypt. Hagar the Egyptian, kind of makes sense that that's where she was acquired. So she comes with them. But, Sarai. We're going to learn a lot more about Sarai than we ever thought. Because the only thing that normally we understand about Sarai is the one line that says, and she called her husband Lord. Oh, she was this submissive woman. No, that wasn't Sarai. And that wasn't even Sarah later on. Take a look here. Now behold, the Lord has prevented me. In other words, she starts off with, the only reason I don't have any children is because God did it to me. He has prevented me. He's the one that caused this problem. He can fix it, but he hasn't. I will obtain children through her. This is Sarah's mind. She's going to fix it. She says, maybe this is the way to solve the problem. And from a, here again, from culture standpoint, it was perfectly acceptable. That was nothing, they weren't doing anything that would be considered culturally wrong. 
Perhaps I'll attain children through her. And Abraham listened to the voice of his wife. In other words, who was in charge? Uh -huh. Okay. It was Sarah. She was in charge. And you're going to find many other times that she was in charge. We think of Abraham as a great man. Um, but when it came to his home life, I, um, he was a little bit questioned sometimes. So then he gave her to her, her maid, and gave her to her husband, Abram, as his wife. Now, even in that culture, it wasn't just, well, here's my slave, get her pregnant, and then we'll take the baby and it'll be ours. No, there had to be a marriage. They understood this, that it wasn't just the case of just passing along. And this was, we're going to find the importance of that a little later on, of how this whole concept of this marriage was important. So at this point, he had only had one wife? That we know of. Sometimes when things are omitted, we assume. And I'm pretty sure that there was only one wife. You know, otherwise, it doesn't really make sense of other parts of the story. But it's not an, there's never an absolute in those circumstances. But I think the fact that he had no other children probably more than likely was that Sarah was his only wife. So this was Sarah's, she had a plan. She's going to take control. So because there must be another way because God had set out, you know, that we were going to have children and I'm not getting pregnant. So I think God just needs a little bit of help in this one. So we're going to try to help him out a little bit. So that's Sarah's plan. Genesis 16, 4 and 5. He went into Hagar and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, <coughs> her mistress was despised in her sight. And Sarah said to Abraham, May the wrong done me be upon you. I gave my maid into your arms, but when she saw that she conceived, I was despised in her sight. May the Lord judge between you and me. Hagar becomes pregnant. She is all of a sudden going from the slave girl to the wife to now the mother. And it might even be a son. And if that happens, her son becomes the firstborn. Her son would inherit everything. So her position has just been elevated from about as low as you can be to about as high as you can be. So now she looks at her former boss. <laughs> Guess who's the boss now? Sarah didn't take that real well. And then, a typical female reaction. May the wrong done me be upon you. In other words, Abram, it's your fault. You did this. Every guy who's been married for any length of time really knows that line. Understands it completely. Without a shadow of a doubt, any good husband is at fault. It's just the way it is. Guys, just accept it. It's just the way it is. This is nothing new. Even back then, with Abram and Sarai, it was Abram's fault. I was despised in her sight. This is what happened. Now she looks at me like, you're nothing. I'm a somebody. Her plans backfired, which so often happens when we make plans and we try to leave God out of the equation, not trust him. If we make our own plans, it backfires. There might be a culture and many years difference, but there are a lot of similarities. In Genesis 16, eight through, 6 through 8, But Abraham said to Sarai, Behold, your maid is in your power. Do to her what 
good in your sight. So Sarah treated her harshly, and she fled from her presence. Now the angel of the Lord found her by the spring of water in the wilderness, by the spring of the way to Shur. He said to Hagar, Sarah's maid, where have you come from, and where are you going? And she said, I am fleeing from the presence of my mistress, Sarai. So Sarai's really going to set things straight. I just got to kind of get some things straightened out of who's the boss here. So she takes over and just makes sure that she keeps Hagar under her thumb. So I'm going to just keep her down. I'm not going to let her rise up. Even though she's pregnant and you know, my husband's baby and all that, but um, we got to do something about this. Abram, being the good husband he is, uh, you got a problem? Go, go ahead. Just take care of it yourself. Go do whatever you want to her. That's okay. That's what continues. But now, notice something again that is the two little points I want to pull out of here, too. Because Hagar runs. She goes out into the wilderness. But what does she find but a spring of water? What is our life but being out in this wilderness and this spring of water of Christ coming into our lives and providing for us our needs? Such a refreshment that's there. You think God didn't care about Hagar? Yes, he did. She is this lowly slave girl, but God cares about her. She's the one that's running away. She's been treated wrongly, but God stands up for her. God takes care of her. It's like in our lives. We're out there in that wilderness. We have all these problems, but that spring swells up because the Spirit of God comes to us and takes care of us. Again, one of those little tidbits in the midst of a story that can so easily be missed. And then there's another little tidbit that I think has been missed by most people. You've got two women fighting. Two women fighting. What happens? There isn't forgiveness. There isn't stopping of this. Women are notorious for hanging on to a grudge. Far more so than men are. This particular one, do you realize it has been going on for over 4,000 years now? Between the Jews and the Arabs? Because that's the two groups of people we got here. So you got a cat fight that's been going on for 4,000 years. Genesis 16, 10, 11, and 16. Moreover, the angel of the Lord said to her, I will greatly multiply your descendants so that they will be too many to count. The angel of the Lord said to her father, Behold, you are with child, and you shall bear a son, and you shall call his name Ishmael, because the Lord has given heed to your affliction. Abraham was 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to him. Almost sounds familiar words. Your descendants, they will be too many to count. God's promise to Abraham, your descendants will be like the stars of the heavens, too many to count, like the sand by the seashore. Okay? And the angel's father said, Behold, you are with child. The angel came to Jesus, or to Mary. You are with child. And you will bear a son. And you will bear a son. And you will call his name Emmanuel. You will call his name Ishmael. There is a reflection. There is a miraculous thing going on, but it's not the same. Because there is two distinct groups that are being talked about. And we're going to see that towards the end far more clearly about these two distinct groups. But the similarities are definitely there. At this time, Sarah would have been 76 years old when Ishmael was born. Just a little side information. There's actually only 10 years apart between Abraham and Sarah. Genesis 17, 15, then God said to Abraham, as for Sarah, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. The only woman in the Bible who God changed their name. Interesting. Yes, the number of men's names were changed. She is the second woman after Eve to be mentioned, and she is the only one whose name was changed by God. But Sarai means princess. Beautiful woman. 
She was a princess. She was a matriarch. And then you have Sarah, mother of nations. See, she went and changed from being what the world looks at to what God looks at. Changed of who she was in her role of what she was to become. It didn't really change who she was, but it definitely changed her role. In Genesis 18, 10 through 15, and he said, I will surely return to you at this time next year, and behold, Sarah, your wife, will have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent door, which was behind him. Now Abram and Sarah were old, advanced in age. Sarah was past childbearing. Sarah laughed to herself and saying, After I have become old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord being old also? This can't happen. We're too old. That time of life is past. So she, 10 years apart. They were 10 years apart in their age. Uh, no, no, because Abram was 99, Sarah was 89 when the promise came. He was 100 and then 90 at the birth. Right? So here's the promise. I will return to you, and not only will I return to you, but I will return to you next year. In other words, the time frame has now been set. And Sarah just, she laughs to herself, says, this cannot be. And you can understand that, okay? You've done gone through that life cycle to where no longer is it possible for you to have children. Okay, this just ain't going to happen. And the Lord said to Abraham, picking up at verse 13, why did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I indeed bear a child when I am old? Is, every, is anything too difficult for the Lord? At the appointed time, I will return to you. At this time next year, and Sarah will have a son. Sarah denied it, however, saying, I did not laugh, for she was afraid. And he said, No, but you did laugh. She laughed to herself, kind of hiding in the tent. And then... And this was the Lord himself was there, and the two angels. This was when they were on there, came by Abraham. This was before the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, when that was getting ready to take place. And they stopped and explained this promise. This promise of a son, this promise that this child would be born. And they come, and they hear it, and it can't be. Sarah laughs. The Lord says, you laughed. She says, no, I didn't. No, I didn't. Do we hide things from God? Do we say, no, I didn't. I didn't mean to. Genesis 21, 1 through 3 and verse 8. Then the Lord took note of Sarah as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah as he had promised. So Sarah conceived and bore a son to Abraham in his old age at the appointed time of which God had spoken to him. Abraham called the name of his son who was born to him, whom Sarah bore to him, Isaac. The child grew and was weaned, and Abraham made a great feast on the day that Isaac was weaned. And here's the interesting thing. Isaac, the name of Isaac is, means laughter. God doesn't have a sense of humor? Oh, I think he has a sense of humor. Genesis 21, 9 through 12. Now Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, whom she had bore to Abraham, mocking. Therefore she said to Abraham, Drive out this maid and her son, for the son of the maid shall not be an heir with my son Isaac. The matter distressed Abraham greatly because of his son. But God said to Abraham, Do not be distressed because of the lad and your maid. Whatever Sarah tells you, listen to her, and through Isaac your descendants shall be named. Uh, we've got to pick this scenario up and we kind of think about this and some of it doesn't seem to really quite make sense. Sarah comes to Abraham you know, after seeing Ishmael in some way, there's no clarity in exactly what happened, but somehow or another he was mocking or playing in a way that they, she didn't think was correct with her son. 
Okay, so you've got these two women and each with their sons, and they don't like each other. Okay, we've known this for some time now. Now this is 12 years later. So you've got, you might say, a young man and you might say this little guy, and there's something definitely wrong here, and Sarah's just fed up with it. I can't take it no more. You gotta get rid of both of them. Abraham, you can understand his problem is he's thinking, that's my son. You're asking me to throw my son out. That's gotta be a difficult scenario. So he goes to God about it. And God says, no, you listen to what Sarah says. You throw them out. Don't worry, I'm gonna take care of them. Now this is one of these circumstances in life where we find that when Jesus talks about the fact that if you don't hate your mother, if you don't hate your brother, if you don't hate your father, or if you love them more than me, you're not worthy of me. There was a purpose. There was a prophecy that was getting laid out here that was part of God's plan. Abraham and Sarah would have no way of knowing it, nor did they ever learn it, of what had to take place. Because there was a teaching that was going to be done that was going to be a benefit throughout all the ages for the church itself. That was going to be shown and taught because of the circumstances that were taking place now. The circumstances seemed to be so totally wrong and so totally out of place, they didn't really make sense because God, a good loving God, would tell a man to take your son and throw him away? This is a loving God? I said, no, you need to do this. You need to put me first. And even though I'm using your wife, that strong-willed woman which we have learned, in order to get this going, she's right and not even realizing it. And you need to follow. Whatever Sarah tells you, listen to her. For through Isaac, your descendants shall be named. It is important. It is important for Isaac to be the firstborn in this family. Because if it's Ishmael, my plan isn't there. I have a plan for Ishmael. But I have a plan for Isaac, and that Isaac is going to be, and there's a reason why it has to be Isaac and not Ishmael. And we're going to learn that here in a minute. When we look at Galatians, and that's the beauty of the Old Testament giving information in the New, is now we can take what was abstract and we can see clarity coming out. Because now some of these difficult passages get explained. In Galatians 4, verses 23 to 26, for it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by the bondwoman and one by the free woman. Keep those in mind, the bondwoman and free woman, two sons, this is important. But the son of the bondwoman was born according to the flesh, and the son of the free woman through the promise. This is, the, this is allegorically speaking, this was an we're now using that story, which was a factual historical story, and we're showing how it is an allegory. Normally, it goes the other way around. For these women are two covenants, one proceeding from Mount Sinai, bearing children who are to be slaves. She is Hagar. Now, this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to the present Jerusalem. For she is in slavery with her children, but the Jerusalem above is free. She is our mother. Now we've got to break that up a little bit because there's a lot there. And how this whole allegory is explaining itself on how you have the bondwoman and the free woman. Because the bondwoman, the child, the offspring of the bondwoman would have been in slavery. And that's slavery, and, they, and then the scripture passage uses proceeding from Mount Sinai. What happened at Mount Sinai? This is where the law was given. The law is a slave master. 
It is. The law is the slave master. Because if you're under the law, you are a slave to the law. But then we have the new Jerusalem, which is from above, which is Christ. Which is freedom. So the bondwoman, the slave woman, the offspring of the slave is one group. The child of the free woman is the other group. Two covenants, two groups. So which one are we part of? We are part of either we are slaves under the law or we are freed under Christ. We are free. And this is freedom indeed. So the whole concept of the slave woman having a child as the allegory and the free woman having a child in whom the nation, the, let's say the Christ actually would be named had to be the free woman. It couldn't be the bond woman. It had to be Sarah. It couldn't be Hagar because she wasn't free. She didn't represent the free. But Sarah represented the free. But the Jerusalem above is free. She is our mother. We talk about the mother church. The mother of the church. Because if it's according to the flesh, which remember Ishmael was born according to the flesh, then it works. But if it's according to freedom, then it's according to grace. Continuing on in Galatians, chapter 4, verses 28 to 31. And you, like Isaac, are children of promise. Clearing it up more and more. But as at that time he who was born according to the flesh persecuted who, him who was born according to the spirit. Remember Isaac being thrown out? I mean, uh, Ishmael being thrown out because of the way he was persecuting Isaac? So it is now also. The world persecutes the church. But what does scripture say? Cast out the bondwoman and her son. We are to cast out that whole concept of being under the law. Or to throw that away with all of its restraints. For the son of the bondwoman shall not be an heir with the son of the free woman. Because if we are under that bondage, if we don't throw that bondage out, then we are not free. We are depending upon our good works for salvation. And there shall not be an heir. We shall not be, receive the promise. So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free woman. Here is that Paul is clarifying it to the Corinthians. I mean, the, the Galatians, I mean. It is freedom what we have. We're not under slavery no more. We're not under the law. We are free. In Romans 9, verses 6 through 9. But it is not as though the word of God has failed, for they are not all Israel who are descended from Israel. <clears throat> Another one of those things that's kind of misconstrued. And this is what the Jews thought at the time of Christ was walking the earth. Well, our father Abraham, because Abraham is our father, we're children of God. Paul is clearly telling them, no. It's not because you have a bloodline. That bloodline doesn't do you any good. For they are not all Israel who are descended from Israel, nor are they all children because they are Abraham's. It's not according to the flesh. Abraham's descendants. But through Isaac your descendants will be made. That it is not the children of the flesh who are children of God, but the children of the promise. So it's not by the being born into this certain family, coming from this certain group. 
it's because of the promise and that greatest promise that there ever was made and that promise is Christ that's how we're part of the family it is not because you're a Jew For this is the word of the promise. At this time I shall come, and Sarah shall have a son. See, was, he was a child of promise, not according to the flesh. Yeah, he was born according to the flesh, but at a time in Abram and Sarah's life when they couldn't have children. Or at least Sarah couldn't. Actually, Abraham had more children later on. But that's another story. Um, but because it was a promise, it had to be miraculous, but not the miraculous like Jesus. It, the sin part was still there. That hadn't gone away. And then that famous passage that people like to take, ignoring everything that we just talked about, about who Sarah was, and put her into that classification of this submissive, meek little wife. You'd have to ignore everything we talked about in order to put that here. 1 Peter 3, verses 5 through 7. For this is the way in former times the holy women also who hoped in God used to adorn themselves, being submissive to their own husbands, just as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, and you have become her children. If you do what is right without being frightened by any fear. She was respectful, as a wife should be. She understood where the roles were, but then again, she wasn't a pushover. She understood that Abram was, as should be today, where the man should be the spiritual head of the house. She understood that, but it didn't mean that she kept her mouth shut. In no way, shape, or form did she keep her mouth shut. We saw way too many examples of where she didn't. She was a strong woman. She had an own mind. She was independent in that sense. But at the same time, there was respect factor that demonstrated that she was a child of God and that it meant something to her. Verse seven, you husbands in the same way, live with your wives in an understanding way, as with someone weaker since she is a woman and show her honor as a fellow heir of the grace of life, the whole concept of a fellow heir. Together we are. Fellow heir of grace. So it's not superior man or woman. We are equal in Christ. So that your prayers will not be hindered. Isn't that interesting that it ends with that? So your prayers will not be hindered because we so often don't realize that if we're harboring sins in our life, it has an effect on our prayers. So we can think that, well, I can kind of do what I want and, uh, but you know, then, then I just pray and no. Prayer is communication with God. Communication with God it needs to have a relationship with Him. A relationship with Him requires honesty and openness. You can't have a relationship with anyone that's worth anything without those two factors. So honesty, openness with who we are, coming before God in our prayers, demonstrating that, yes, I'm a sinner saved by grace. I know this. But I'm striving. I'm striving to please you because I want to. Because I want that relationship to grow. So when I understand and see all the failures of these great people throughout Scripture, I understand I fit right in there. I'm not exempt from this. But it doesn't exempt me from the love of God. Just because I fail, his love doesn't. Because throughout all of the missteps that Abram and Sarai took, God's plan came through. Isaac was born. And then you had Jacob, and then you had the 12 tribes, and then you had all the kings, and then you had Christ. 
His plan wasn't changed. It came out exactly as he planned. And it still does today. Not through manipulation, not by trying to change things, but by being there in control. He's sovereign. Our God is sovereign in everything. Even when Sarai tries to manipulate it. Even when I try to manipulate it.